Um, thanks so much to the Milk River Watershed Council for inviting me here to the Science Forum. I'm pretty excited to be able to talk to you about some of the long-term trends we've seen in water quality over the years. Um, um, I wanted to thank some of the people that have been involved in the water monitoring program over the years. So these people are the ones that are out there on the ground collecting the data and making this presentation possible. Um, members of the County of Warner, Cardston County, Cypress County, um, those from Milk River Watershed Council and also some of the Alberta Environment and Parks representatives. I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about the Milk River watershed itself because as we know there's a lot of influencers on water quality and um, it helps to have a good understanding about the watershed, talk about the monitoring program and then the trends in water quality that we've seen. Um, there is a lot of data that we've collected over the years so I'm going to focus my effort on the total phosphorus, total suspended solids and salts uh, type discussion. So as you know, the Milk River watershed is um, located in southern Alberta, right on the border. Uh, it's one of the smallest watersheds in the province. It's about 6,664 square kilometers in size. About 60% of this watershed area is crown land and about 40% is deeded. Now, although it looks small, Milk River watershed spans the boundary and shares its boundary with Saskatchewan and also Montana. So the watershed is quite large. When you look at precipitation trends over the watershed, um, generally we see higher precipitation to the western side of the basin. So around 450 millimeters of rainfall falls towards the west and about 316 millimeters as you move eastward uh, in the Alberta portion of the watershed. Land cover, we see a lot of native grassland still present here in the watershed. Uh, see some cropland in the central part of the watershed. Um, within the Cypress Hills area, see some forested lands. And again, that's representative of some of the natural region characteristics uh, within the basin. In terms of hydrology, we have the main stem Milk River that's headwaters um, originate in Montana. We have the North Fork of the Milk River, which is actually one of the main tributaries to the Milk River. It looks like the actual main stem, but it is the tributary. The North Fork flows into Alberta, just here. And then what we call the South Fork is actually the main stem. Um, South Fork drains area of grassland. It doesn't have as high flow during most of the season, um, but it is the main stem and it originates here. Flows for about 288 kilometers eastward back into Montana. Stream flow averages about 292 million meters cubed per year. 22% of the runoff water is generated in the Milk River South Fork area in Montana. 8% of the runoff is generated along the North Fork of the Milk River in Montana and about 10% from the remaining area in the watershed. So surface runoff contributions are relatively small in the basin. This is one of uh, a very highly regulated system. So there's hydrometric stations that measure stream flow across the watershed. Um, this is to account for water that's distributed between Montana and Alberta uh, through some of the um, Boundary Waters Treaty uh, negotiations and the order, the 1921 order um, that allocates water in the basin. So there's also, um, some water regulation that happens between Alberta and Saskatchewan. So you'll see a lot of hydrometric stations in this area, um, just making sure that everybody's receiving their amount of water that they were given. So I like to show this picture because it's a back to a reality check. We can generate water from runoff and have a lot of, of data um, talking about stream flow averages, but sometimes there's water in the river and sometimes there's not. This picture was taken in 2001 um, in a dry year, of course, 
and the water just wasn't flowing. So about 61% of the water that you see flowing through the Milk River is actually St. Mary River water. Um, so the river is sustained by uh, the diversion flows, the St. Mary River diversion um, that originates in Montana. So water is stored in Lake Sherburn in Montana and it's released into the St. Mary River, passes through the old diversion structure and passes through a siphon. This siphon was built back in 1917, um, so it's quite ancient. It's 100 years old this year. Um, the water is driven down these pipes, crosses back over the St. Mary River, and back up the other side of the, of the valley there into a canal. Water flows a distance through the canals, and it's um, directed to the Milk River, the North Fork in Alberta. Passes that 288 kilometers through our part of the province, and then flows back downstream into Montana, into Fresno Reservoir. So water management is fairly important to the water quality story. So I just want to keep the, you to keep this in mind. Um, how water is managed um, through the system as we go through this discussion. So the water management um, results in an annual hydrograph that looks something like this. So we have those low flows starting out at the beginning of the year. That St. Mary River water diversion is turned on, so it's like a tap. Flows come up. They're sustained through the summer months, and then um, the water is turned off in the fall again, usually in September, and flows return to a normal type flow. So if you compare the recorded and natural weekly flows, the natural flow of the Milk River would be the red line that you see in this graph, and the recorded flow is the purple line. So the recorded flow is that augmented flow from the St. Mary River diversion. So that diversion is influenced by a number of things. One is water management in Montana itself. Those are things that in Alberta we can't control. So for instance, in 2011, there was a lot of flooding in, in Montana, south of our border and downstream of our reach of the Milk River. Um, in a wet year, they would turn the water off at the Sherburn, so not to proliferate the flooding or make it worse. So, so in those times, you see the flows in the Milk River in Alberta um, be reduced. So this is just that hydrograph in 2010 and 2011 that shows the results of some of that water management. Um, the average 2007 to 2011 flows is in the green, and the long-term average is the blue. The 2010 value is the purple, and you can see where the water was either reduced in May and June, and in 2011, the water wasn't turned on until the end of uh, June into July. So again, water regulation will influence water quality, and I'll talk about that more. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands how much the water can fluctuate in the river um, before we talk about what the quality looks like. So some other influencers on water quality is river gradient and channel morphology. So there's four distinct reaches um, that have been identified in the Milk River. That's the North Fork Milk River, where the diversion enters. The Milk River Gravel Bed Reach is the central part of the system. The South Fork Milk River is the main stem Milk River, but the South Fork. And then the Milk River Sand Bed Reach is the most downstream reach. So each of those have unique characteristics that influence water quality. So the Gravel Bed Reach has a gravelly, cobbly bottom. Milk River sand bed reach is mainly sand and highly mobile. 
So AMEC back in 2008 did a study that looked at erosion rates and channel morphology and structure of the river itself. And this is just a meandering channel bend um, showing how the channel ch uh, shifts across the floodplain through time. So, oops. So you can see that there's some really old meandered channel scars there that we haven't documented a date on, but the channel shifts a lot and wants to move across its floodplain. And that's a natural process, but it can be accelerated um, through human influence like water management uh, and increasing flows um, in the basin. So that's a little background on the watershed and how water is managed, and we'll relate that back to water quality now. So the Milk River Watershed in 2006 initiated a water monitoring program where they collected uh, water samples twice per, per month from April, May, and June, and once per month, July through October. So that's 10 samples that are collected yearly, and samples are only collected when there's visible flow present, so that we're not sampling stagnant uh, type water. A number of parameters are analyzed. Uh, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, and pH are measured in the field with a handheld unit. Um, conductivity is measured. It's a measurement of salts in the water and total dissolved solids. Nutrients, total phosphorus, total nitrogen are measured. Total suspended solids and fecal coliform bacteria. I'm only going to talk about the three, three parameters. So if we look at the water monitoring site, the sites were selected so they represent each of those river reaches that I presented. Um, there's also some additional monitoring sites we won't talk about on the tributaries. And there's a number of sites downstream into Montana as well. And it's interesting to see some of the data from those sites. So we'll just be talking about these five sites along the main stem. The green circle is the South Fork. We'll also talk about two sites in Montana. One is downstream of Fresno, and the other is at Nashua, which is just upstream of the Missouri River. So here's a few photos of the river itself, the North Fork, upstream of Milk River, and the Pinhorn site. So I pulled together the data to compare water quality by site. And I also combined the four sites along the main stem that are influenced by the diversion so that you can see the difference um, between the sites that are influenced by the diversion and the south fork of the Milk River. Looked at annual variations and also a five-year comparison. Um, 2006, the sampling season really started in July, June or July, um, so it wasn't a full year. So what it looks like six years of data, it's really five and a half. Um, we also look at natural versus diversion flow periods and compare that to some of the water quality guidelines. Now, a lot of the data is presented in box plots. So box plots are really simple to read. Um, focus on the median or the middle value of the data set, which is the line in the middle of the box. The lower end of the box is the 25th percentile. So that means that 75% of the data in that set is higher than that value. The 75th percentile is the same. 75% of the values in the data set are below that value. So if we look at the water quality guidelines that will compare the Milk River water quality to, um, the guidelines were updated in 2014. We're looking at irrigation water quality guidelines. Um, less than 1,000 micro siemens per centimeter is safe for irrigation. Anything higher than that poses a possible risk. Um, the guidelines say that if it lies between 1,000 and 2,000 micro siemens per centimeter, um, it's possibly safe. I'm not quite sure what possibly means, but if it's over 2,000, then it can be hazardous. So salt impacts a plant's ability to uptake water. So if it's too high, the plant um, will dry out. It can't get enough water. 
For total phosphorus, the historic guideline was 0 0.05 milligrams per liter, and that was a really great benchmark. Um, in the update, the guideline was revised, and it says now for major rivers, phosphorus concentrations should be maintained so as to prevent detrimental changes in algal and aquatic communities. So that means you need to have some reference point. Um, what constitutes a change? So I'll still refer to the old 0 0.05 um, and talk a little bit more about that. For total suspended solids, there is no guideline. So it's just a reference to itself. Within the Milk River Integrated Watershed Management Plan, there was objectives created um, based on the historical data that we had available. And it followed the same process as that, what was done in the South Saskatchewan <coughs> Regional Planning Process. Um, so I'll talk more about that. And then down in Montana, they've also developed criteria for water quality. And their criteria is 0.11 milligrams per liter for phosphorus. So it's quite a bit higher than our historic guideline. It's double. So I'll, I'll compare the data to that as well. So if we look at stream flow from 2006, I don't have the stream flow for 15 or 16 actually in a graphic form. But you can see that we have the same trends every year. We have the water turned on comes up, it's sustained through the summer months, and then the water flows um, go down again. So and in there we have some peaks where we had a lot of rainfall, um, and some valleys where the diversion may have been turned off. So we know that the diversion start up dates and end dates um, for all of these years. You can see in 2011, um, we talked about that a little bit, the start up date was July rather than in March or April when it's typically turned on. So if we look at some of the water quality trends um, for Milk River, this is total phosphorus on the upper graph. It's in the green. We're showing the total phosphorus for the north fork of Milk River down to the pinhorn, so um, upstream to downstream. And the Milk River at 501 is that South Fork uh, main stem Milk River. You can see as water flows down through the system, phosphorus increases. So this is a good trend. It's a solid trend. Um, we're going from that gravel bed reach down to a very dynamic sand bed reach um, in the, at the Pinhorn site. Um, the bottom red line is the historic 0 0.05 milligrams per liter guideline. Um, so the median at the upper end of the watershed is meeting that guideline, but at the lower end we're exceeding it. And in some cases we're exceeding the dotted line, which is the Montana's criteria. But phosphorus is found in two forms in the environment. One is a dissolved form and one is a particulate form. It binds to sediment. So there's a very strong trend of phosphorus with sediment. So if sediment's transported, we'll also see phosphorus moving and transported downstream. So if we look at phosphorus data from 2006 to 2016, see that median value, that middle line in the green boxes, it doesn't move around too much. Um, And again, the median value bounces around that 0 0.05 milligrams per liter and is below the 0 0.11 uh, milligrams per liter from the Montana criteria. And the same trend is seen with sediment. If we compare two sets of data, the five-year period, 2006 to 2011, with 2012 to 2016, we don't see too much difference between those values. So water quality in the Milk River isn't changing um, or varying too much um, through time. And that's to be expected. The main driver here is water management. So as long as the diversion um, is, is um, continuing, 
um, the water quality is staying fairly similar. There is a trend um, in total phosphorus concentration. It's related to the diversion versus natural flow. So during the diversion period, we see higher concentrations of phosphorus. And during the natural flow period, we see lower concentrations. Um, the di during the diversion, the higher flows um, prolong the saturation of the stream banks down in the downstream end near the Pinhorn, Highway 880. Um, you see a lot of sand. Uh, being moved around, that sand when it's saturated is highly erodible. You also see some of the sand resuspended from the bottom of the bed, and that sediment gets carried downstream too. So in the natural flow, we don't have the same velocity or carrying capacity of the water to carry that sediment downstream, and it gets settled out um, and deposited. We also see some trends between spring, summer, and winter. Um, generally, we see more rainfall in the springtime. Um, we have more runoff in the spring that can carry um, phosphorus and other nutrients to um, water. So we see higher concentrations in the spring. Things set, um, settle into the same trend that we've seen in the summer months where the diversion is providing somewhat consistent flow through the system. Um, so we just see that increase in phosphorus as it moves downstream. In winter, when we have natural flow, phosphorus concentrations are quite low and consistent across the watershed. So if we look at the South Fork, it acts a little differently than the, the other main stem sites because the diversion doesn't influence water quality there. Um, again, that solid red line is the historic water quality guideline, and the dotted line is the Montana criteria. We see that most of these um, years, the median values, even the 75th percentile values are below that historic guideline, and even below the Montana's criteria. Similar to the main stem, phosphorus is bound to the sediment, so total suspended solids is showing the same trend. And if we compare the two five-year periods, 2006 to 2011, 2012 to 2016, phosphorus concentrations aren't changing too much, and sediment concentrations aren't changing too much. So within the Milk River Integrated Watershed Management Plan, those water quality objectives were defined, and they're based on the historic water quality data, so looking at the 50th percentile or the median values and the 90th uh, percentile or values. Um, this is the same process that the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan followed. Um, if we look over the years, most of the data that's collected is um, within the objective, so it's not exceeding. So if it's colored green in this chart, it's met the objective. If it's colored yellow, it's above the objective but not of uh, concern. And if it's in red, we're seeing an increasing trend in the water that year. Uh, what we need to do is look at a five-year rolling average and compare that back to the objective. So this is just on an annual basis. If it's red, it may mean that we had higher flows um, for a certain amount of time that increased erosion. Um, but it's not to be of a concern unless it's persistent through time. This is total suspended solids for the main stem sites. Most years are meeting the objectives. This is total phosphorus looking across the entire watershed, so from the headwaters, which are in Alberta, down to Nashua, down in Montana. So you can see our headwater site looks pretty good. So we have lower phosphorus concentrations um, compared to the downstream end. And that's typical of systems. You can see concentrations um, of phosphorus increasing as, as water flows downstream. This point here is the outlet of Fresno Reservoir. So you can see that phosphorus um, 
concentrations are very low as it comes out of Fresno. Reservoirs tend to have a cleansing effect on water quality. Um, sediment and nutrients can be deposited and buried in the long term in those reservoirs, and that's what's happening here. So we've had this conversation about is total phosphorus then a concern uh, for the Milk River. When you talk about other watersheds in the province, phosphorus is a major concern. Uh, phosphorus contributes to eutrophication or nutrient enrichment in water bodies. And when we have nutrient enrichment, we increase the amount of algae and plants uh, that are in that system. When those plants die, they use up oxygen and can degrade water quality for other species living there like fish. Um, so here in the Milk River, we know that it's relatively a murky or milky um, water body. Uh, Mary Weather Lewis and William, William Clark acknowledged that when they first came out. This is a milky system. So the light can't penetrate through the water column. And plants need light to grow, so the process of photosynthesis is inhibited. So if plants can't photosynthesize, they can't grow. So even though phosphorus is there and enriching that water body, um, the plant still cannot grow. So it's not as much a concern in the Milk River here as it is, say, in the Bow River, uh, where light can penetrate through and increase that algae and aquatic mac macrophyte growth. So a similar trend is with sediment, um, looking at the headwaters of the Milk River. Sediment tends to be lower and increases as you move downstream. Here at the Fresno Reservoir, all that good Alberta real estate gets deposited uh, in Fresno and to the point where it's lost 60% of its capacity to store water. So all of that sediment that's piling up at the bottom of Fresno um, is, is reducing the capacity to store water there. Um, AMEC in their study in 2008 looked just at the natural channel width of the Milk River. Um, naturally, the North Fork of the Milk River ranged from 14 to 30 meters in width. In 2007, that width had increased by 15 meters. If you look at the Milk River sand bed reach, the natural width of the channel was 38 to 96 meters wide, and in 2007, it had increased by 21 meters, so to 71 to 120 meters. So when we think about where all that sediment is coming from and being mobilized um, through stream bank erosion, um, it's carrying phosphorus and moving it downstream and filling up Fresno Reservoir. So part of that has to do back with water management. Okay, I'm going to move to dissolved salts. So that's really the phosphorus and sediment trends. For dissolved salts, um, the Milk River main stem is fairly salty. The median values are about 200 to 300 microsiemens per centimeter. Remember the, uh, the guideline is under 1,000, so the red line there is safe for irrigation. So the water quality is safe for irrigation. Um, salts are a little bit higher in the South Fork, the main stem of the Milk River. If we look at trends from 2006 to 2016, um, salts are fairly consistent. We see increases in salt in 2010 and 2011. Uh, if you think back to the graph I showed you of the flows, um, the St. Mary River diversion wasn't active as long in 2010 or 2011. So we, had, we saw more natural flow in the river and higher concentrations of salt. Over the two five-year periods, we're not seeing much change. And here we have the opposite trend. So during the diversion period, salts tend to be lower. During the natural flow period, salts tend to be higher. So base flows in the tributaries to the Milk River are sustained by springs. Uh, so oftentimes these tributaries will dry up um, late June, early July. 
Um, and the spring water we know is high in salt. So if anybody has a well out there and you've tested your water quality, it's likely that it's going to be a little higher in salt. Um, Red Creek, for example, has conductivity values that range from 1,870 to 2,990 microsiemens. So anything over 2,000 is considered unsafe for irrigation. Um, so Red Creek is, an, is a water course that you wouldn't want to irrigate out of. For the South Fork, um, conductivity values are all below the irrigation guidelines, so it's safe for irrigation. Um, again, the trends are showing fairly similar uh, salt levels over the years. In terms of meeting water quality objectives, um, again, um, the conductivity is meeting all the objectives that were set. So to summarize, the main drivers for water quality in Milk River are water management and groundwater influences. Augmentation of flow by the St. Mary River brings higher quality water to the Milk River for a substantial period of time, uh, April to September. These prolonged periods of higher flows, though, can saturate the stream banks and make them more susceptible to erosion. The low flows tend to be less erosive, but they can't carry that suspended sediment. Um, so you'll see lower concentrations. Phosphorus is transported by suspended sediment, and these two parameters trend together. Um, in comparison, uh, the South Fork Milk River to the rest of the river, we see higher salt concentrations, and we see lower total phosphorus and total suspension.